So my name's Sarah, and this is my twin. Hi, I'm Kristen. And we both um, went to PA school together, and now we both work at the same hospital together. I'm in critical care and pulmonology, and then I'm in cardiology. So we see each other a lot at the hospital, often have the same patients, which is confusing for a lot of patients. <laughs> and nurses and doctors, yeah. Today, we give a lot of lectures in PA school to like classes below us about like various topics. And so we do this a lot during and lectures, we're used to it. So this topic will be primarily ABGs, how to approach arterial blood gases, and also the different types like metabolic versus respiratory. And we'll go through all the etiologies and just try to make it very simple and clear, and also give you some tidbits that you may not read in a textbook as well. Hopefully this will help you in the pants, getting all those ABG questions right. And then just clinically help you as well when you read an ABG, how to do it very fast, efficient, and correctly. So this is very informal. You can chat, you can unmute and talk if you have any questions. It's supposed to be more interactive. Typically in the past, we haven't had a lot on, on our slides. We just have people take notes, but this requires, I think, more writing. So we made slides, but you feel free to take notes. And yeah, let me share my screen. But yeah, it is. Oh, Katie, I just thought, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, we like working together. I we wait. Who feels comfortable with ABG? If we gave you one right now, with the pH, the bicarb, the CO2 levels. Comfortable 50 50. Okay. Okay, so I'm guessing y'all can all see this. Hopefully you can. Let me present. Okay, don't need. Okay, sorry, I'm still like admitting people. I basically have to approve if you come into this meeting. Okay, I'm just going to go over the basics and just start. If you were to know nothing, just to just give a baseline, just because I feel like it's good to review everything. So our body likes to maintain homeostasis and we regulate the acidity of our blood very tightly. We like it between, our body likes it between 7.35 and 7.45. That's typically regarded as a normal pH of the body or the blood. And there's lots of mechanisms we have to keep the pH within that range because if it gets out of that range, homeostasis is erupted and enzymes don't work as well. Metabolic processes don't work as well. And so we want that range to be pretty tightly regulated. But there's three big components. I would say the first one is a chemical buffer. This happens within seconds, like rapidly. And I'll quickly review this. So y'all know our tissues go through a lot of processes, metabolic pathways and by or CO2, carbon dioxide is a byproduct of that. And so that leaves the tissues into the bloodstream and it combines with water to form carbonic acid. And this is a weak acid. It acts as a buffering system and it happens within seconds. And as soon as it's made, it typically is dissociated into bicarb and a hydrogen ion. This goes through the blood, goes to the lungs, and then carbonic antihydrase is an enzyme that causes bicarb to turn into CO2 for the lungs to breathe it out. So we breathe out the CO2. So that's a chemical buffer. It happens rapidly. And like I said, the lungs play a component in this. The lungs breathe out carbon dioxide. And this is a little bit slower than it happens and can happen in minutes. Fun fact, if you were to hyperventilate for 15 minutes, you can actually increase your pH by 0, 0 0.02, I believe. So that's kind of cool, I thought. But so our lungs can control the carbon dioxide levels. We can breathe more rapidly, and that breathes out more carbon dioxide, raising the pH, making it more alkalotic. And on the other hand, we can hypoventilate or breathe slowly. Carbon dioxide is retained, it accumulates, and the pH becomes more acidic, more low. And so that's the, what the lungs play a big part in carbon dioxide regulation. And then lastly, the great kidneys, these are the slowest. They take the longest to respond to pH imbalances. It could usually three to five days, I believe on average, but basically they help resorb more bicarb and they can excrete acid, but this takes quite a long time compared to the other two. So really just three main things. There's also other systems, but we won't talk about them. Yeah. Any questions on that? That was kind of a quick review just to go over what our body does. So sorry, was gonna, someone going to say something? No. Okay. So here's the equation I just talked about. You can review your biochemistry and stuff if you want to more. And this is what I just said too, as well. Oh, the lungs react in minutes. Yeah. Chemical buffers are rapidly in seconds. Lungs can react in minutes. Typically, clinically, you can, let's say someone's acidotic at the hospital. I put them on a BiPAP machine. Um, they, they're, they'll respond in minutes. Yes. But typically 
we recheck ABG in two hours and that will be the most optimal time to see how well they're responding to that. So they do respond in minutes, but we can be recheck ABGs within hours to see how well the lungs respond. So if that makes sense. So if you put anyone on BiPAP, recheck ABG in two hours, that's, and then see if it's helping. That's like a clinical tip and side note. Okay. So that was kind of the intro. Kristen's going to talk about metabolic issues and focus on metabolic acidosis because everyone loves that. And the anion gap is great. And then I'll talk about respiratory issues because I'm in pulmonology and talk about respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. And at the very end, we are going to go through the questions I had posted previously. If you want to stay for that, I created four or five practice questions and I didn't post the answers. So I'll go over the answers. So you'll have them. Okay. 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 Hi. So metabolic acidosis, who, who can list off some things that causes a metabolic acidosis, whether a normal or high anion gap? Can we list off a few? DKA. Great. Great example. Diabetic ketoacidosis is one. What other things can cause a metabolic acidosis? Uremia. Good. It's like renal failure. Patients that haven't had dialysis in a long time will come in and they will, they will be often acidotic. Methanol. Good. So Ethanol, ethylene glycol ingestion can cause a very, very severe metabolic acidosis. Great. So those are some things, sepsis, uh, Sarah can talk about that. So when you have, if you're septic and your lactate's high, lactic acidosis is a cause of metabolic acidosis. So basically when the body's unable to buffer the pH of the blood, there's a metabolic condition that arises and it can be either acidotic or alkalotic. Uh, and so before I go on, I want to know one, one more thing. Uh, when you get a BMP, in the hospital or like you're looking at a BMP in the clinic, it's going to say CO2 on a BMP. And what that is, it's technically bicarb because it's the CO2 that's being measured. It's a lab technicality is the total carbon dioxide content in, in the blood. The majority of that is bicarb. So when you're looking at a CO2 in a BMP, you're actually looking at the bicarb level. So that's very important. I think it was confusing starting off in rotations and noticing that. So metabolic acidosis occurs when there's increased acid production, we lose too much bicarb, or the kidneys are not functioning, the nephrons are not able to excrete the acids. And typically, you know, the pH will, if the body's not able to compensate, the pH will be less than 7.35. And so when we talk about the anion gap, this is when it gets a little confusing. There's this law of big word, like electrochemical neutrality, when the number of cations and anions in the system should neutralize should be zero. And that happens in our body. However, when we measure an anion gap, we're measuring certain cations and anions. We're not measuring every cation and anion in our body. So that means that we're only measuring sodium as a cation and then bicarbonate chloride as an anion, typically. Some people measure potassium, as you can see here in this picture, but typically it's just sodium. And so that gives you a number. And the range, it depends on who you talk to. It can be 4 to 12, 3 to 10. Sarah, do you normally say 4 to 12? Yeah. That's what's your range? Difficult. Okay. Yeah. So that's normal to have that gap because there's these anions and stuff that we're not measuring here. So we take that equation and it's normal to have that. But in metabolic acidosis, things that cause a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis include a loss of bicarb. And then chloride will try to compensate as that happens. So what is probably the most common cause of a non-ion anion gap metabolic acidosis? What's happening on the left here in this diagram? So it would be diarrhea. So that would be the most common cause of a non anion anion gap metabolic acidosis. Typically, we see that. So that you have a lot of bicarb in your stool. So when you have excessive diarrhea, a lot of that is being wasted and your body will compensate and try to increase the chloride and you'll become acidotic. And other things that are commonly seen, especially in the hospital setting, is too much saline. So normal saline has a lot of chloride in it, more than our body has. The ratio and increasing the chloride will cause a non-ion and anion gap metabolic acidosis. And then also we won't go more into this, but renal tubular acidosis, there's different types. One of those can cause that. So those are the main things. I know there's a really long acronym that they teach in different programs like used CARPs, but those are the three main that I think we should know. And then as for high anion gap metabolic acidosis, that would be like DKA or lactic acidosis or meth methanol or ethylene glycol. So what happens here is, is that we have these anions being formed that are not measured in this equation. Because they're not measured in this equation, there's this huge difference in the gap. 
So let's say, for example, I'm undergoing anaerobic metabolism. My lactate is high. I have lactic acidosis. So the bicarb is used up to buffer that. I don't want to become too acidotic. And then those lactate anions are formed. And that's an unmeasured anion not in this equation. So we get a, we get a gap, a high anion gap, metabolic acidosis. And so those are the unmeasured anions. Sarah drew this picture, but here's a list of the other ones like albumin, sulfates, phosphates, lactic acid, as I said, and all the organic like ones that we've talked about. If we go, I think to the next slide, sir. So a great way to remember this, you know, there's mud piles, which is great. I'm really bad at remembering acronyms more than four letters. So like we said, we use this, we use this equation to determine, we're, we're basically determining the cause of the metabolic acidosis. Like what is causing this, this? And so we, there's an acronym DALT, D-A-L-T. And this is something you should probably remember for your entire career as a PA, no matter what you do, I feel like this is something important to know. First is diabetic ketoacidosis. So as those, as your body is not able to use glucose, you get lipolysis and that releases free fatty acids, which turn into ketones and accumulate in the body. And that is a very common cause of a high anionic metabolic acidosis. And these patients typically present with a compensatory mechanism. So what is some classic finding of DKA that you think would be a sign of them having a metabolic acidosis? Hyperventilation. Perfect. Yeah. So like Sarah explained earlier, we blow off our CO2. We're wanting to maintain a homeostatic pH, a tight range there, 7.35, 7.45. So we hyperventilate. It's called Kuzmal's respirations, um, which is the uh, combination of hyperpnea, which is something I didn't learn until after PA school, but increased tidal volume. Um, and then tachypnea, which is increased respiratory rate. So basically these patients will be hyperventilating, pulling off the CO2. And it looks pretty yeah. scary. Like you walk in the room and they're like, <gasps> like breathing. It looks like they're in respiratory distress, but you actually want them to do that because they're compensating and they're trying to breathe off all that, that CO2. So it may look scary when you walk in and they're breathing out all the CO2 and you check at ABG and their pH is like 6.9. <laughs> so they can look very, very sick, but their bodies, it's actually a good sign that they're breathing off all that CO2. So side note. Oh, could I repeat that? Oh, the, oh, the hyperpnea, hyper, and then P and EA, which is an increased tidal volume. So you, you're increasing the amount of air you're breathing out. And then tachypnea, which is an increased respiratory rate. And that combined is Kuzmal's respiration. Classic, that, on exams would, a lot. Yeah, would you, is that what you wanted me to repeat, Tiffany? I just want to make sure. Yes, okay, perfect. And then the other four are acute kidney injury or renal insufficiency. So as the kidneys stop working as well, they're unable to excrete hydrogen. And so you get an accumulation of that and those ions in the blood. And then lactic acidosis, as I talked about, and then toxin ingestions like ethylene glycol. Does anybody have any questions about the anion gap versus a non-ionin gap metabolic acidosis that causes? The most common cause of a high anion gap metabolic acidosis is probably between lactic acidosis and an AKI. I think in the hospital, lactic acidosis accounts for 50% of all high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So it's very common. But yeah, remember it's all forever. Kristen's right. That's really important. Okay. And then the next thing is, so that is just what I said, kind of an outline format. And now we'll talk about alkalosis. So typically there's too much bicarb, either due to decrease of hydrogen ion or just increase by carb concentration. Also for the metabolic acidosis, sometimes if it gets really bad, they, in the hospital setting, they treat with bicarb. And I guess Sarah can explain that a little bit. Oh yeah. Typically studies have shown, shown with an acute kidney injury and severe acidosis, sodium bicarb helps improve like outcomes. Also, if someone has a pH lower than 7.5, vasopressors, levofed won't work as well. And so sodium bicarb may be given to help with that acidosis to help the vasopressors function better. And then also for rhabdomyolysis, that can cause an intense acute kidney injury from the pigment deposits in the kidney. And so you would start a sodium bicarb drip for rhabdomyolysis causing acute kidney injury. So sodium bicarb, bicarb is used a lot for acidosis. It's not the end all be all. Some people use it way too much. It does have adverse effects. It's not the cure for everything, but it also is very helpful in the situations I just mentioned. And then John, what did you say? There's an extra cation. Do you mean potassium? Yeah. So yeah, so, potassium sometimes factored in, sometimes it's not. 
it's not it's just, just so small it's negligent i mean it doesn't really yeah huge role in the equation is that what you meant it can be used but typically since it doesn't play a big role in the the it's not it doesn't have to be in the equation if that makes sense maybe bad joke oh it was a joke <laughs> sorry <laughs> Oh, it was a joke. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh my god. Uh, oh my goodness, we must say it. No, that's funny. Um, no, it's okay. So, no, it was, you're, you're fine. <laughs> you're so fine. Sarah and I just sometimes don't get jokes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it goes over our heads. So, alkalosis. What are some causes of a metabolic alkalosis that y'all know of? So basically, we have too much bicarb. We're releasing too many ions. Sorry, say that one more time. Vomiting. Vomiting. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. That's the most, the first thing we, I think of is emesis. Your stomach has a lot of gastric juices that are high acid. So when you vomit, you're vomiting all that out. And then also NG suction, which is basically the same thing, but with the device. And then diuretics is a very common cause of metabolic alkalosis. Sometimes it's given the con- term contraction, alkalosis, and then other things include too much aldosterone, whether that be through Cushing syndrome or hyperaldosterone. Um, and that's due to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, where aldosterone pools in sodium at the expense of hydrogen and potassium. So that's why that can cause a metabolic alkalosis and then cystic fibrosis as well, and sort of the same way as diuretics do. Let's see. So sometimes we'll hold the diuretics, and sometimes a carbonic anhydrase, anhydrase inhibitor is given which is increases the excretion of sodium bicarb. Rology normally does that for patients that I see cardiac patients on diuretics. And one important point to remember here is potassium replacement. So often to help the metabolic alkalosis to improve it is we give potassium as well because it sometimes won't correct without it. It helps improve the metabolic alkalosis. So that's quickly on that. I think metabolic acidosis is a little bit more high yield than alkalosis in my opinion. And you will compensate with your respiratory rate will you hypoventilate. Yeah. So that was metabolic. Any questions on that? I'd say high yield is knowing the difference between a non or non and high anion gap metabolic acidosis and being able to determine the difference knowing your differentials for a high anion gap, you can use a long acronym or you can just use DOL. And then alkalosis is commonly due to vomiting. Know that forever. Okay. So respiratory acidosis. So I deal with this every day. What are some causes of respiratory acidosis? COPD, good. That's a great one. COPD, yours. Yeah. Just that? Anything else? Opioids. Yeah. So those are the big ones. Yeah, those are probably, I would say those are the very two common ones. So I like it to break it up into four main parts. First, the brain or your respiratory center and inhibition of that neuromuscular, the airway, and then the lung parenchyma. And so, oh yeah, obesity syndrome, obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Yes. So acidosis, just when you think of respiratory acidosis, think of hypoventilation, something hypoventilation, something is causing the body to breathe slower. And we have to kind of figure out, well, what is it? And the first one under this inhibition of the medulla or the respiratory center, this opioids would go underneath this. Also tumors would, or any intracranial mass, stroke, tumor, this could all cause central respiratory depression. And so that's something to keep in mind. Next one would be neuromuscular. So what is something you can think of neuromuscular that could cause hypoventilation or impact the body's ability to breathe? Anything? Yeah, Guillaume Bray. Good, Kristen. Yeah, <laughs> Guillaume Bray. Myasthenia gravis. Yes, I've seen that. Yes. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. ALS can. Transverse mellitus. Multiple sclerosis. If you have paralysis of your diaphragm or any peripheral nerve paralysis. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, hemi paralyzed diaphragm. That was good. So yeah, all those issues can cause decreased ability of the body to breathe. And when they're not able to move the muscles and nerves as well to move, then you get increased CO2, carbon dioxide, and then you get respiratory acidosis. And then also airways, like I said before, COPD causes obstructive ventilatory defect, asthma can, an airway obstruction, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea is a very common one, very common, obesity, hypoventilation, 
ventilation syndrome. So really anything that obstructs the airway, whether that be intrinsic or in the neck or extrinsic. And then, oh yeah, spinal trauma. That's a good one. Yeah. For neuromuscular. Good. And then also the lungs to the actual lung parenchyma. Sometimes pulmonary edema can cause some hypercapnia and acidosis. Pneumonia sometimes can, but typically the main things are these first three. So just, I would just memorize, I would, instead of long lists are hard to remember forever. You know what I mean? In PA school, I know we got like tons of slides with just like these long lists of stuff and etiologies and causes. And really just for your benefit, I would just memorize big like categories. And then, you know, from looking at this, what the small things are. So just memorize these four big chunks and then you'll be good. So any questions on acidosis, respiratory acidosis? No. Okay. And then I oh, went the wrong way. Okay. So I put this here because hopefully this isn't too confusing, but this will help you in reading your ABGs because with respiratory acidosis, something really cool about it is you can actually tell the timeline of if it's acute, acute or chronic or chronic um, based on the bicarb. The bicarbonate gives us an idea of how long this respiratory acidosis has been going on for, because like I said before, the kidneys take three to five days to respond to a lung issue. So we have a primary respiratory acidosis. That means our pH is abnormal. So it's going to be low. And then the bicarb is going to, the kidneys are going to try to respond. And that takes a couple of days. So let me go through each scenario. Hopefully this isn't too much in detail, but so I know when I look at an ABG, I know patients in an acute decompensation if their pH, of course, is abnormal. So abnormal pH and a respiratory acidosis means this is an acute issue. And then for me, when I look at ABG, I can tell that the difference between acute, just acute versus acute on chronic by looking at the bicarb. So let's, for example, let's have a 20-year-old male who overdoses on like fentanyl, comes in the ER, altered, and ABG is, we get an ABG and their pH is like 7.0, their carbon dioxide levels are like 70, and then their bicarb is normal. And I'm like, oh, this is definitely an acute issue. This hasn't been going on for a long time because their bicarb is normal. So I know that's just an acute, they don't have chronic respiratory acidosis. This is just an acute, the young male who overdosed on fentanyl. When looking at acute on chronic though, let's, let's say I have a patient who has COPD come in the ER, who's altered, we get an ABG, the pH is abnormal. The CO2 carbon dioxide is very high, but then I look at the bicarb and it's also high. Let's say it's like in the fifties, which is crazy high. You're like, oh, they've been, their kidneys have been working. They've been, they're trying to compensate for chronic respiratory acidosis. This has been going on for a while. So that's when you know it's acute on chronic, like hypercapnic respiratory failure. And then lastly, some, if I were to check an ABG on any OPD or walking around, their pH is probably normal, even if their carbon dioxide levels are very high their baseline CO2 may be in the sixties, to be honest. But the reason they're able to live at that is because their kidneys have been compensating and their bicarb is probably like chronically in the thirties, forties, fifties, who knows, but hopefully that makes sense. And respiratory acidosis, it's cool. I think it's really, it's a cool diagnosis because you can know it can help. You can kind of know like how acute versus chronic it is. Yeah. So chronic, acute on chronic, yeah, would be, if it's acute on chronic, they're not compensated. If it's chronic, they're fully compensated. That's just a general rule. There are some exceptions, of course, but in general, chronic respiratory, like acidosis is comp fully compensated. So does that make sense, Alexa? Is that what your question was? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. And then that's, that's my favorite diagnosis. It's a it, respiratory acidosis is pretty cool. And then BiPAP helps a lot with it anyway. Okay. So then lastly is alkalosis. It's what causes respiratory alkalosis. This one's kind of a weird one. Not many people like this, or it's not like a commonly asked about one, I would say on test, but I don't see it in real life as often as acidosis, but it can happen. There, Katie asked a really good question. She, since the kidneys are compensating chronic, can this cause kidney damage in the long run? Oh, that's actually a really good question. I actually don't know. Let me get back with you. I don't think so. I mean, they're probably working, pumping pretty hard, but let me get back to you on that. I don't know if it causes like mechanical or functional damage. So I'll get back with you for sure. Okay. And then alkalosis. So anyone, 
know what can cause anxiety. Good. Yeah. Hyperventilation. Anything that causes hyperventilation can cause respiratory alkalosis. So pain, anxiety, fevers, sepsis causes increase in cytokines like AL1 and IL6 that can actually act on the brain, the respiratory center and cause you to increase your respiratory rate. So that can cause alkalosis. PE, pulmonary embolism can, that's a good one. Um, hypoxemia can. So anything that causes hypoxemia can cause respiratory alkalosis. Drugs, good. Aspirin can actually cause a respiratory alkalosis and a metabolic acidosis. That one's a fun one because it can cause both, but we won't go over that. So yeah, I would just remember anything that causes people to hyperventilate can cause respiratory alkalosis. Panic attacks is a big one because that's, yeah, because they're just breathing so fast. Okay, any questions? That one was kind of fast, but there's not a ton of things. Okay, I'll move on. So now we'll finally, we're finally getting to how to approach an ABG. So we went over all the etiologies. We probably could have done this other way too, but I think it's helpful to know what you're just know things that cause abnormal acid base issues. And then we're going to go over how to actually approach an ABG, how to do it fast and efficient and simply. So Kristen, do you want to go over you, this? You can go ahead. You can go over this. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So typically first, when I look at an ABG, I look at the O2, make sure they're not severely hypoxemic and need to be like intubated or something, but that's just clinically in real life. Or I mean, on exam too, it's helpful, but yes. So look at the O2. Also make sure it's an A arterial blood gas, not a venous blood gas. Yes. So and then we look at the pH. Is it abnormal? Is it acidic or basic? So that's the first thing I would all so just look at the pH. Is it lower? And then after that, we look at the carbon dioxide level. And this is the most important question you can probably ask when you're evaluating an ABG is asking yourself, is this related to the pH or not? So is the level of the carbon dioxide, is it related to the, the number of the pH? So for example, sorry, this is kind of wordy. So if the pH is really low, let's say the pH is 7.2. And I, that was the first step. We look at the pH. Next one, we look at the carbon dioxide it, and we look and see that it's really high. It's 70 or something it's super high. And so like, oh, that's related. So the pH is low and the CO2 carbon dioxide is high. And that means that's what you would expect to happen. So they're related to each other. So that is a primary respiratory issue. So we can say that with certainty. And on the other hand, if we look at the pH and it's really high, like 7.5, and we're like, okay, next step is look at carbon dioxide and it's really low, let's say in the twenties, you're like, oh, this is, this is related because as we know, when carbon dioxide goes down, the pH goes up, they're inversely related. So yes, this is related. So it's a primary respiratory alkalosis. It's a primary respiratory issue. So that's really the most important question you can ask when you evaluate ABG is how is the carbon dioxide level related to the pH? And then lastly, and then if the pH is normal, we, so you look at the pH and it's actually normal. We look at the carbon dioxide level and is it closer to the acidic side or the basic side? So this is where it gets a little trippy, tricky. That's why I'm going to show an example in a second of what I would do with that. And then I'll tell you, well, what happens if it's not related? So let's say I look at the, the pH and it's 7.2 and I look at the carbon dioxide level and it's normal. Let's say, oh, well, it's not related. Their pH is low, but their carbon dioxide level is normal. That that means this is a metabolic issue. So when the carbon dioxide and the pH are not related, this means this is a primary metabolic issue. So it's not the the respiratory, it, it's not the issue. Does that make sense? That was, I said that kind of slow and, and intense because that gets people confused. So when the carbon dioxide level is not related to the pH, we look at the bicarb and then that's means it's, we compare it to the pH and if it's related, it's a primary metabolic issue. And then last we look at compensation. So we look at the opposite system. So we see the pH, look at the carbon dioxide. And then lastly, you're like, is the is there any compensation? Is it partial, none, or complete? And so, and then lastly, we check the anion gap. So I think the best thing, this is what I use. I think the best thing is to do practice questions, to be honest. It's better than having to explain this. Sometimes doing it, just practicing is the best way. So no matter how many times I say this, unless you practice it, it's not going to click. So any questions on that before I move on? I think practice, we have a few practice little examples that I think will help if you're scratching your head. Okay. Okay. So 
let me do the first one and then we'll go from there. The last one's when the pH is normal. So if you're confused on what I said earlier, that one will be a good one for you to listen to. So the first one, what I do is check the O2. So good. They're not too hypox, they're not hypoxemic. And then I look at the pH, it's low. So, okay. If they're acidotic for some reason. So I look at the carbon dioxide and like, oh, it's high. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. That's related. So immediately I know this is a primary respiratory acidosis because the carbon dioxide is driving the low pH. And then like, well, let's see if the kidneys are compensating. So look at the bicarb and it's up. I'm like, oh, so they're compensating a little bit, but since the pH is abnormal, it's only partial compensation. So the pH is abnormal. The kidneys aren't fully pulling in there. So I would say this is a primary respiratory acidosis with incomplete metabolic compensation. Is that clear? Okay. Kristen, do you want to do the next one? Sure. So yeah. Okay. So, oh, go ahead. Were you going to say something? No, no, it's okay. You can go ahead. Okay. So here we have, first we look at the oxygen, make sure they're not hypoxic. They are. <laughs> <laughs> so I would manage that first. And then, and then look at the pH. So at 7.54. This patient is alkalotic. And let's look at the carbon dioxide to see if it relates to the pH. So the CO2 is up a bit, but we would expect with an elevated CO2 to be acidotic. So it doesn't seem like the pH and the CO2 are being are related here. So this is not a primary respiratory issue. So it's going to be a metabolic issue. So we look at the, the bicarb. And as we can expect, the bicarb is elevated. So there's a lot of bicarb in the blood. And this means the patient has an alkalosis. So this would be a primary metabolic alkalosis with an incomplete respiratory compensation because the pH is not normal. If the pH was normal, then it would be a complete compensation. So that is that one. Good. Want- and then any questions on that one? No. Okay. And then lastly, this is the one that people get confused when the pH is normal, but okay, there's still to real quick. Yeah. What so, yeah. so would it be incomplete or would it be partially compensated? Or is that, I don't know, is that like the same? Because I know there's incomplete, partial, and full. It would be partial because, yes, because oh. the lungs are still responding. Yeah. If the CO2 is normal, then it would be, there would be no compensation at all. Okay. Perfect. I just wanted to double check that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Sorry. I, I, Sorry. I, no, I no, you're good. I tend to use like incomplete with the same thing as partial. I would say okay. no compensation if it's none, right, Kristen? Like, you could say like just no compensation. Yeah, I guess you could say no compensation at all. Like incomplete and partial, I guess sometimes we use interchangeably. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Bro. No, no, you're fine. Yeah, you're good. And then the last one is tricky. So we look at the pH, we're like, oh, their body's functioning normally. And, but we look over here and like, oh, yikes, there's some abnormal lab values. So like we did before, we start with the carbon dioxide and it's pretty low. So we're like, oh, they're probably alkalotic. We look at the pH, it's normal though. And it also, not only is it normal, and this is important, it's on the lower side of normal. So it's it's almost, if we moved a few points downward, it would be acidotic. And so, but that doesn't relate to this because carbon dioxide being low, that's an alkalosis. So we're like, huh, this is kind of interesting. It's probably not related to the respiratory system. So we look at the bicarb and the bicarb is pretty low. And we're like, oh, this, they're, and we look, and we know when bicarb gets slow, our body becomes more acidotic. And so we look back at the pH, see it's more, it's normal, but it's more on the, it's closer to the acidic side. So I would say this is a primary metabolic acidosis with full respiratory compensation because the pH is normal. So the, the, this would probably be a DKA patient, to be honest, because their anion gap is high. They're acidotic, but they're also breathing really fast because their carbon dioxide level is really low. And so they're compensating. And so the pH is normal. So this would, that would be like a DKA patient. So does that make sense to everybody? You still, you kind of still go through the process, but since you look at the pH range and you see if it's more on the, what kind of side is it on? Is it more lower or is it more gearing towards alkalosis? That one's a little bit more tricky. I would do practice. Yes. T- yeah, Tiffany. So I look at the pH, it's normal, but so then I move to the carbon dioxide and it's low. And when carbon dioxide is low, that means that's alkalosis or that, that I mean, that's the respiratory system is trying to bring the body back to an alkalosis. And so I'm like, oh, this doesn't line up with 
the pH because the pH is on actually the, even though it's normal, it's on the range that it's closer to an acidemia, meaning it's closer. If it just was like 7.34, it would be considered acidosis. So I'm like, huh? So I moved to the bicarb and the bicarb is very, very low. And as we know, when we get decreased bicarb, the loss of bicarb causes the acidosis. So I go, I kind of like, well, this is closer to acidosis. Like it's normal, but closer to being acidic. So this is a metabolic issue because it relates more to the bicarb, what the direction of the bicarb, if that makes sense. And we just have full respiratory compensation. So that's why it's normal. And if that still doesn't make sense, just message me and all we can chit chat. <laughs> it is confusing. It takes, it, it is, it is weird because you're like, oh, well, this is normal, but there's still some things that are happening that's behind the scenes. Okay. Any questions? So I made this a while back during PA school when we were tutoring students. So these are just 10 pearls I would take away from acid-based issues just to remember forever as a clinician and for exams, for your pants, for any test, just remember these 10 main points. If you have any questions on that, let me know. But yes, I always like to do, there's like some information is more important than other information just in PA school and in life. So there's, you always should, after hearing any lecture or anything, you should always be like, what's the most important thing I just heard. And these 10 points are pretty important. So I remember them. Okay. Questions. So, or first, do y'all have any questions? Cause I'm about to start some practice questions. Does y'all feel okay with ABGs or do y'all want to, did that help? Anything that we could clarify or be more helpful? With ABGs, it just takes practice, like just doing, sitting down, you can look up online, lots of like practice questions, just doing them, checking your work, seeing what you're getting right, what you're getting wrong. And eventually it's like riding a bike. Once you can look at ABGs and read them, you can do it forever. And there's also mixed respiratory metabolic issues, but we're not going to touch on that. But just know this was just the basics. There's a lot more complicated acid-based issues that are mixed, but we won't go over that. So you can... You can leave. We won't be offended if you leave, but we're going to go over these practice questions. I posted a worksheet on the Mighty Network site. So we are going to go over those if you want. Yeah. The carbon dioxide in the blood is about 70% by carb, right? That's, I'm pretty sure. Is it more or? Oh, wait, I can't hear you. I saw that it was, I looked it up. It was and saw it was 70, but I can okay. verify. I think it's yeah, it might be more actually, but I think average at 70%. How frequent are these sessions? Every two weeks. We try to do them every two weeks. Is there anything y'all want? Last time, everyone said they want an EKG review. It's on. So if you go to the study groups on Mighty Networks, it's under the PA twins. If you join our study group, there's the worksheet I had to post about that, but you have to join our actual study group to find the worksheet. Yes, EKGs. Okay. PFTs. But yeah, oh yeah, PFTs. Uh, PFTs are so fun. They're fun. And EKGs are fun. And I like EKGs from a cardiology standpoint. I think well, someone wanted us to go over anemias, like hemolytic anemias, I think last time. I think that was one of interest. We typically try to do mostly cardiology and pulmonology, but we also can do whatever, whatever y'all want. So yes, EKG or antibiotics. Yeah, we can do antibiotics. <laughs> Oh, drugs, cardiology, autonomic drugs. Oh, that's good. That's great. a good one. That's okay, good. we'll keep these in mind. I'll start. Okay. okay, yes, antibiotics. So let's start the questions. If you want to stay, you can. If you don't want to stay, we won't get our feelings hurt. Y'all are busy in school, so you'll have stuff to do. Okay, I'm trying to get everything so I can actually see the screen. So we have a 35 year old. Kristen, do you want to do this one or do you want me to do this one? You can go ahead. I haven't seen these questions yet. I'll do the next one. Okay. 35 year old female presents the ER with diarrhea for five days. She's uncomfortable and thinks she ate something bad. Which of the following acid-based issues would you expect to see in a person with diarrhea? So we have an A. Good. Anyone disagree? Good, good, good. So yeah, good. Good. We drove home that point. So the most common cause of a Metabolic acidosis, the normal anion gap is diarrhea because you're losing all the rich bicarb juices from that diarrhea. Um, and so patients become more acidotic. So good. The answer is A. Anyone, any questions that you would expect a normal anion gap? Okay. Okay. 
Uh, which the following is not a cause of a respiratory acidosis, neuromuscular disorders, obstructive defect in the lungs, hyperventilation, obesity, or opioids. C, perfect. Yes. Yeah, drive that home that hyperventilation is a very common cause of respiratory alkalosis. All the other ones are what Sarah talked about causing a respiratory acidosis. Good. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Okay. Which of the following best describes this ABG? So pH is 7.2, carbon dioxide is 72, bicarb is 42, and the anion gap is 10. And you can take your time. So far, I got D, D, D. Good, yeah, yeah, y'all are good. Wow, that's great. Great, great job. Yay, you are going to get 100 too. on ABGs. Yes, the answer is D. It's a primary respiratory acidosis with incomplete metabolic compensation. So we look at the pH, pH is low. We look at the carbon dioxide and we're like, oh, this is high. So it's related to the pH. So it's a primary respiratory issue. We look at the bicarb to see if it's compensating. It's up. It is up, but it's not compensating all the way because the pH is still abnormal. So we say with incomplete metabolic compensation. So good. That was perfect. Okay. And then which of the following is a known cause of a high anion gap metabolic acidosis? Perfect. E, like I said, Sarah even spelled it out nicely. Dalt is the. <laughs> Sorry, that was that probably we, too easy. <laughs> <laughs> that we use to all the above our causes. I made the worksheet before we made like the PowerPoint. So uh, <laughs> that's great. Probably should have changed that out. Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> really well, that's it. That's all we have for y'all. Thanks for listening. I hope PA school is going well. Or if you're a PA, I hope the PA life is going well. What are some causes of lactic acidosis? So there's two types of lactic acidosis, technically type one and type. Sorry, I'm answering your question. You can. Y'all can leave if you want. So there's two types. Type one is due to like anaerobic metabolism. So tissue like hypoperfusion or ischemia causing anaerobic metabolism. So like shock is a big one, like hypovolemia. So anything that would cause anaerobic metabolism that would cause lactic acidosis. And then type two is inability to clear lactic acid. So that would be like people who are have cirrhosis or acute liver failure. They can't clear lactic as well. So that could actually accumulate lactic acid, lactic acid in cause a false positive reading. So any cirrhotic patient with an elevated lactic acid, that's probably due to their poor liver function and lactic acid accumulates. So there's two types, type one and type two. One is anaerobic metabolism. The other one is due to inability to clear the lactic acid. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Those are the, and there you can, if you want to, you can look at it, look at up, it on up to date too, or whatever you use to study. Yeah, they, yeah, thank y'all for listening. Thank y'all so much for listening. Yeah, about 100 on the, the practice question. So, the, yeah, the lecture, the lecture will be posted. posted. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, it's recorded. So you want to go back? Yes. Yeah, no problem. Wow, y'all are so thankful. <laughs> <laughs> y'all take care. Y'all take care, okay? We'll see y'all next time. Okay, I'm going to end this meeting soon. I was trying to mess through. I got a few direct messages. So I was trying to finish that. Okay.